This is a special edition episode of Swallow the Gap. It continues the discussion from the April 20th webinar, Dysphagia in Patients with Pulmonary Compromise, ICU and Beyond. It's a special release that falls between Season 1 and 2, covering topics related to dysphagia practice in patients in the intensive care unit, but it's relevant to long-term acute care units and many other settings that involve patients with dysphagia who also have pulmonary involvement. Thank you for tuning in. Hope you're excited for season two coming up soon. And help us to kick off the Confounding Case series this Thursday, June 27th at 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific time to explore the puzzling referral of unspecified dysphagia with Dr. Kendria Grant. Visit swallowthegap.com slash live courses for details and hope to see you there. On today's podcast episode, please join Dr. Grant, Dr. Martin Brodsky, Joe Puntiel, George Barnes, and myself, Tim Stockdale. There we go. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Um, hopefully, welcome back if you came to the first event. If not, we're glad to have you here. We need your questions to get started. This is totally audience-led, so we need the questions that you have to throw out here to this panel of experts. And with that, let's see. Let me quit sharing screen here so you can actually see their real faces. Would you mind? Um, actually, can we go around? Would you mind introducing yourself, starting maybe the George? You want to go ahead? Sure. You can hear me okay? Little though, I can hear you okay though. Okay, I'll speak up. My name is George Barnes. I am a speech pathologist. I spend most of my time in a critical illness recovery hospital. So I see lots of patients who are, um, by definition, critically ill. It's also known as a long term acute care hospital. So we're seeing patients usually after respiratory failure, lots of trach, spends, feeding tubes. And um, I always say there is no feeling in the world like getting people the first opportunity that they have to eat and drink and speak again, sometimes after months of being unable to. It is, uh, it's my pride and joy. I love doing it and I'm lucky to do it. Good deal. Good deal. Um, Dr. Grant? Hi, everyone. Uh, Kendrick Grant. I'm associate professor at the University of Pittsburgh um, and speech pathologist of <clears throat> years. And my clinical specialty is primarily in neurodegenerative diseases. Um, I am our ALS uh, speech pathologist for a specialized ALS clinic. Um, and so that's primarily what I've been doing in the past 15 years or so. Um, so we're just really happy to be here. And thank you all for joining us late on a Thursday night or at least on Eastern Standard Time. Mm-hmm. So glad to be here. <laughs> Good deal. All right, uh, Joe and Dr. Brodsky, you guys are going to have to arm wrestle to see who goes next. So I, I don't know. Let's just guess. Yeah. Marty, Joe would win. <laughs> Joe would win. All right, you uh, go ahead. I don't. He's a, I don't care. He's a tiger, man. Don't underestimate <laughs> yeah. her. Well, like, what is it? Age before beauty. <laughs> what I heard. <laughs> All right, I'm Joe Puntil. I, like George, have the opportunity to work in critical care. I've worked in a level mm-hmm. one or level two trauma center for, I want to say, over 35 years. Um, and like George said, I mean, I just want to say ditto. It's fabulous to be able to get people to communicate and eat in critical care on machines, off machines, on high flow, off high flow. And I kind of feel like you do, George, you know, the more critical they are, um, the more exciting it is. I don't know if that's a little twisted, but it's just, you're not just treating the patient, you're treating the whole family, um, friends, caregivers, and all of that. It's just a, a dynamic, your day is just different every single day. I love it. I love acute care. Absolutely love it. Yeah. yeah. Pioneer of sorts in our field, I would say. Is that is that fair, Marty? That's pretty fair. Pretty fair. All right. Yeah. Dr. Coyle called me. He's old enough to be a pioneer. How's that? (laughs) The Oregon Trail. (laughs) Yeah, I look pretty good for 80, don't I? (laughs) Right? Yeah, you look great. So I'm Marty Brodsky. I'm a speech pathologist as well. Um, Section head at Cleveland Clinic for speech pathology. Now in the otolaryngology head and neck surgery department, formerly known as Head and Neck Institute. Um, I also hold an adjunct position uh, as an associate professor at Johns Hopkins in both physical medicine and pulmonary and critical care medicine. My primary research is in ICU post-extubation, although I've gotten into the during extubation extubation part of it, um, uh, dealing with airway voice and swallowing. Prior to research, 
um, all or, or most of my time spent doing therapy straight up was acute care. Uh, right now, because I do research, everything is now pulled into the outpatient area and I get to see those patients on the other end of the spectrum. So I get to see basically the entire spectrum between my research and my clinical work. And it's uh, an absolute pleasure and a privilege to do that. Glad to have you all here. Uh, <laughs> that's so incendiary. Love you all. Oh, it says oh, someone said to host and panelists. So anyway, this is participant led. So let's get some questions. You should have the ability to upvote too. So upvote questions, put them in the chat. Speak up if you'd like to. So Tim, Megan um, actually had already had a question and Joe answered it, but I think it's okay. fun to also discuss it though. So she was asking about like, um, do does anyone use peak flow meters in the clinical practice in the ICU for purposes of decision making as far as likelihood, you know, to eject um, uh, aspiration, et cetera, and perhaps even to guide treatment on dysphagia yeah. treatment goal or diet, like how conservative it should be, or et cetera. So I know, Joe, do you want to kick us off since you started to answer that question and then we can all kind of jump in as needed? Sure. Anybody can jump in. We, I, yes, we do use peak flow meters. And it's actually the PT or not the PT, I'm sorry, the respiratory therapists that do a lot of that to let us know which, you know, EMST would be good for a patient versus the EMST 150 versus a light. Um, with our cardiovascular patients, we use inspiratory because we don't use expiratory, but yeah, the, I just work so closely with our respiratory therapist regards to that. I mean, it helps us guide how the patient's doing, where their baseline's at, and then when we start using therapy, what what progress that they make with that. Good deal. If y'all are wondering what I'm doing, I'm going to take a picture of this and then add it to my story so there's a direct link on Instagram since people can't join it on there. So smile. <laughs> hey, you need your avatars. Come on. All right, there we go. So I can throw a link now. What else? So if you have a question, there you go. The Q, put it in the Q&A or please make sure that it doesn't just go to host and panelists so that everyone else can see. Okay, this I love this one. Thoughts on hospital policies on waiting 24 hours post extubation before performing clinical swallow evaluations. I can see Marty turning red. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that might be the hue on your computer. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're not reacting to that in any way. I, no, no, but I, I'm doing one of these in the background too, so... <laughs> <laughs> Love it. No, I'll answer Marty. You can talk, talk too. You don't have to wait 24 hours. Uh, Dr. Leader, Dr. Suter had a great um, article that came out that an hour after extubation in our facility, we've been doing that for, gosh, I think almost 10 years, eight years. Um, C.B. Marvin's done it. Marty, you've done research on that. I don't know where the 24-hour rule came. A lot of it is if they're going to get intubated again. But we, we uh, once they get extubated, our nurses do oral cares, uh, clean their mouth, brush their teeth, uh, give us some ice chips, and then do the Yale swallow protocol an hour afterwards. And if they fail, they automatically get a swallowing eval. So I, I can add uh, some of the research side of that. I, I 100% I agree with Joe and everything that she said. Um, I, frankly speaking, I've never not uh, used a 24-hour rule in my practice, and I'm starting 30 years ago. Um, so the bottom line is when the patient is ready. It, there is no clock. There is no time. There's nothing that should keep you from doing this. Early is definitely better. And you want to find the disorder to be able to treat it as soon as possible because that person has spent hours, if not days or weeks on the vent. You want them swallowing as soon as possible. It's the same thing, same principle that physical therapists will go in and do passive range of motion. Um, you want the patient moving those muscles and getting them going. Don't wait. Um, my personal belief uh, if you walk, if you go all the way back to 1979 in the article by Burgess, um, there was no association whatsoever between one hour, four hours, and 24 hours, excuse me, one hour, immediately eight hours and 24 hours um, after extubation and the aspiration that occurred. But if you fast forward to 1995 and take a look at the Larminitz article, what you'll notice is that they dropped an NG tube effectively into a patient's nose to determine the laryngeal reflex and what the sensations oh, would yeah. be, the changes of the, in those sensations. 
And what they found was that if you waited 24 hours, those laryngeal reflexes will improve. Unfortunately, that has little to do with swallowing whatsoever. The entire oral pharynx was bypassed. They dropped 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and uh, I believe one milliliter into the patient's larynx to determine those reflexes, having nothing to do with swallowing. But somehow it was translated clinically as we can wait 24 hours to improve their sensation and therefore we can feed these patients. Please do not mistake sensation for motor production in swallowing. You don't necessarily need sensation if the swallowing system's motor system is intact. So there is no reason to wait whatsoever. You know, Long-winded response. Anybody can add to that. And and also there's some there's a question in the chat regarding when do speech pathologists get involved in the ICU. We just changed our order sets so that anybody that has a neuro um, trauma, um, head bleed, stroke, whatever, gets a, a rehab eval. So if you can change the semantics to rehab where you get PTO oh. and speech then boy, speech is not going to be the stepdaughter or stepchild like usual. Um, we just get, we get in right away, especially like if they're going to mobilize people who are interested, like I said, in the course that we did back in um, April 20th, we do communication boards and education to the family and then they get extubated. We can see them for communication clearly and cognition. So we, um, we get in right away. And if you can change the semantics to that, that helps. All right. Um, that's something we can always come back to that if the other people have more thoughts. I, I think like any one of these topics, we could probably talk about for quite a while, but I'm going to go on to another question here. I, oh, where to go? I recently was comped for inline speaking valve patients, I guess consulted and would like to know what are some considerations for these individuals who may be potentially ready for fees? So inline speaking valves. What are your thoughts? Feeding patients on the vent? That's something that I see a decent amount, so I can take that <clears> one. <throat> I So like everything else, there's really no hard cut rules to this, but I typically, I, I sort of have this general rule in my head that I want to do a fees within a week of the patient being admitted to the facility. And that's really just a reminder to myself to get things started as soon as possible, because a lot of the patients, mm. unfortunately, have come from acute care centers and have not been swallowing anything. So you're so, talking about long-term acute care, right? Okay. This is long-term acute care. So we're typically seeing patients at least a week or two after their respiratory failure, typically respiratory failure. So not every hospital, unfortunately, has the benefit of having renowned clinicians um, like the ones that are on this panel talking about getting started as soon as we can and getting in there and doing all the things that we are uh, supposed to be doing. Unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. So I try to do a fees really unless the patient is extremely unstable. I'll do it within a couple of days up to um, the first week or so. Of course, uh, if, you, if you can try a speaking valve first, that's ideal. So typically we'll wanna see what cuff deflation looks like. Does the patient have adequate air loss, which is um, meaning is adequate air flowing through to the upper airway? Are we seeing an air loss from the ventilator when we're deflating the cuff? And that tells us the patient has a patent airway. And then will they tolerate a speaking valve, which does improve the subglottic pressure and the ability to clear out the airway. And it also improves penetration and aspiration scores. So, um, so ideally we'll have a patient you know, off the vent and on a speaking valve before the fees. Um, but if we can't get them either on inline speaking valve or off the vent completely, I will do a fees with the cuff inflated just to see if at the very least we can start ice chips because of the high risk of atrophy and the high risk of secretions building up and that patient really uh, not having the opportunity down the line to practice that swallow. Any other thoughts? Is George wrong? You disagree? No, I totally agree oh. with you. George. And I, it's too bad that they don't do that. There's a lot of ICU news I know that don't do that, but we try and get involved, right? 
I mean, if someone in the chat, you know, you're trying to read the chat, if you look at it, you talk to the respiratory therapist, they're going to manage the vent so that that patient's going to get enough yeah. air to get through leak speech. You try and do valve speech. I think the biggest determinant for me in, in ICU is generally if they do a perk trach or they get a surgical trach and then they're their trach, clearly we wait about 24 hours before we can get on. It's the the one, if you have, like you said, George, something in the back of my head is PEEP. Like if they're on, you know, 10 or 12 of PEEP and you, the respiratory therapist isn't going to deflate the cuff and try and do leak speech or valve speech because they won't be able to recruit. If you need a whole lot of PEEP to keep your alveoli open in order for gas exchange, then you're pretty fragile. So when they're down to, you know, a five or an eight of PEEP, is usually when they can handle cuff deflation or valve speech. I don't know if anybody else, right, George? I mean, you're seeing, you see yeah. that. So we we yeah. get them in there and get them communicating on the vent. But someone made, like you said, Marty, way back in 1979, someone used to say, well, you got to trach someone within by two weeks. If they're going to be intubated for two weeks and we got to trach them. And if you ask a, resp a pulmonologist, they're like, well, traching someone isn't going to make them get off the vent any faster. But It'll help the larynx a lot if you trach them sooner and we can get them communicating and eating on the vent sooner and mobilizing them easier. So all of that is where those misnomers of those deadlines came. I don't know where those things reared their ugly heads, but they're permanently involved in everybody like in, in their brain. And you're just saying, where did this come from? So it's hard to get that out, but we get in people's rooms right away, depending on their, like, but right, George, I think it's the peep is more than anything. The FAI too can be high and the flow can be high, you know, but when it comes to peep, that if they can't recruit, you don't want to deflate their cuff. They won't be able to handle it. We have a strict protocol that says that the patient needs to be below 30 peak inspiratory pressure, below six, six or below peep, um, and 50% FIO2 or below. And that, because it's so strict, it really does set patients up for success. Unfortunately, it, it cuts out a lot of our patients that I feel like may benefit, but they try to be pretty strict. It's, it's considered a guideline, but the respiratory therapists tend to be pretty conservative with it. And in that case, if a patient does have a PEEP that's a bit high or an FiO2 that's a bit high, I will still do a fees with that patient as long as the physician, of course, clears them and thinks that they're stable enough to tolerate small amounts of ice. And I'm, I'm talking, I'll recommend 10 ice chips three times a day if I have to. So just anything that is not going to be putting the patient at significant risk, of course, if the patient's drowning on their own secretions or if they're unconscious, they're, those are situations where we don't wanna be feeding the patient anything. But if the patient can swallow and, can, and, the, and the ice chips can be helpful either by mobilizing the swallow or thinning out some of those secretions, then I try to get that going as soon as possible. No, it's interesting that you guys have that strict rule because our our respiratory therapists will throw the FI2 up higher, a little bit higher for them to compensate with the, you know, for the flow. And then they sometimes they throw the FIO2 up if they think they're gonna, you know, desat a little bit just so that person can. I mean, I had an ALS patient who ended up on the vent and all he wanted to say was, I love you to his wife and have, you know what I mean? And so we, you just got to just say, hey, you know, we're going to do what's best for this guy. Yeah. Um, you know, and we just start taking one ML at a time of the pilot so that they have a little bit of leak and a little bit of leak so that they can get used to that air in their pharynx and then be able to communicate. He just wanted to tell his kids on a video that he loved him and um, did a whole video with for his kids because they lived all over the country. Yeah. So maybe we're a little bit weird in the wild west, right? I mean, <laughs> you no. Know, if I if I find a respiratory therapist that is very confident and competent and has done this a bunch, they will do the same thing because it is a guideline. It is a guideline, and you're probably talking about RTs that have done this a whole bunch. They're comfortable with you. You're comfortable with them. And I've been in that situation where they will. Um, sort of use it as the guideline that it is. But um, for the most part, our RTs tend to fall in the category of being on the conservative side. And so they'll say, oh, no, 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 FiO2 is too high, blah, blah, blah. But it is good when you get those, um, those ones who are real, a little bit more liberal with it, because you can do a lot in terms of the adjustments. Very cool. Thank you all. Um, there's one question that's been upvoted by several people. And I, this is interesting because this is something that can have a real life impact. So they say their work, 
like none of this other stuff can't, but you'll, you'll see what I'm saying here in a second. So they say my workplace interviewed an SLP. She said she doesn't trial thick and liquids at bedside and that she was not flexible on this as part of her evaluation process. This is different than how we practice for several reasons. My workplace decided not to hire her because of this. What are your thoughts on this method of assessment? Inflexibility with this assessment method and not hiring this person. Well, that sounds political. Mm. Um, I, I'll awful offer some, I, it's probably awful, but I'll offer some context here. Um, back in Logaman's 1983 purple book, she very specifically stated it is not compulsory to try something at the bedside. It is based on clinical judgment as to whether you go down that road. Um, the fact that somebody is inflexible, I take that to be more of a personality mm -hmm. situation and an opportunity to educate. Um, I, I'm, I'm certainly not going to question the person's reasons. What I am going to suggest is I'm a little bit concerned about the inflexibility of, of the individual. Um, and that's what would trigger my concern about hiring the individual. Anybody can be trained. Anybody can be educated. We can square off in the middle of a cafeteria and then drink a beer later. I don't have a problem with that. But if there's inflexibility in personality, that might be an impasse. And that might be a person who's not as much uh, of a team player. And that would be where my concerns are. Could not state that any better. That's exactly what I was thinking. It's one thing to have your reasons for maybe not doing a particular clinical pathway when somebody else may disagree with you. It's quite another though, because I think then for someone that would be that inflexible, that also would be a warning sign to me as the admin person, the hiring person, the supervisor, that then they're also a lot likely to promote shared decision-making. And that's a huge part of our field, right? Um, and not just for ALS when you're talking about end of life stuff, but just for any of our patients. And so that would be a warning sign to me is that then they're also going to be less likely to be flexible with other team members and working in a team collaborative setting that includes that patient and that caregiver at the yeah. forefront of that. So I agree. Yeah, that that's really interesting that, I mean, I'm thinking about this very black and white, and I think you all got the issue kind of behind the question, which I, I really appreciate. I didn't even see that, um, but I would love to, I mean, continue and have more conversation to see if that, if it has to do with inflexibility or if it's like, you know, if she's open to conversation, you said she, they are inflexible about this, um, as far as the rationale goes, I'd like to hear more about that because I feel similarly in terms of, of rationale. I don't, have, I can't remember the last time that I trialed thick and liquids at bedside. However, my clinical practice hasn't been full time for 40 hours a week for a long time. So there may have been an opportunity and perhaps there is a reason for it. Um, but that's typically not something that I feel great about um, per personally. And I can give the reasons, but I really appreciate Marty, you and Kendrea both getting to really the inflexibility issue. That, that was great. I have a feeling that maybe some of the people who upvoted this were interested about the trialing of thickened liquids at bedside. Any of you, you want to throw some food for thought out on that? I, I've never done that unless <laughs> I shouldn't say that unless I have like tomato juice or something that is like naturally thick. Like a naturally thick. Um, I don't think it's. I usually just do thin pureed something chewable, a pill. Usually because of med, I work in ICU a lot and nurses will say, I have to give a pill. And you're like, okay, let's see how we can do this. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll do like what George said, I'll do, we'll do a fees or a modified and find out why the thick and liquids need to be done. But mm -hmm. we don't really have, a, I mean, we do have, I, we use for thick and liquids so rarely in this facility that I don't even know if I could find yeah. it thick and something to try it. Mm -hmm. But I could be, I mean, Kendra, you guys, George, I don't know. Yeah, I don't remember the last time I trialed a thick and liquid during a clinical. It's been long. Now, this, is think... adults. this is adults. I know the pediatric world's really different. 
Yeah, so I've kind of come full circle with this, and I'm sorry that I missed the beginning of this. I hope I don't repeat myself, but um, sure, we touched upon risk of silent aspiration and concern, all the concerns that go along with thickened liquids. What I'll do, though, is, so given the clinical situation of a patient who is, you know, you can't get an instrumental study immediately, say you have to wait at least a day and the patient is coughing violently on thin liquid, but appears to be tolerating nectar thick very well, pureed solids very well, and you have reason to believe, say, their history seems to be, you know, respiratory function seems to be intact, they're on room air, no history of pneumonia, no history of aspiration pneumonia, yes, the risk of silent aspiration is high, and if you can wait until the patient can get that instrumental study before you're able to start PO. But if the patient needs meds and we need to hydrate the patient or get them started on something, and it's like a day or two before you can get that instrumental study, I will say there are on rare occasions where I, where I will recommend that nectar thick liquid, that mm. the puree diet, just to get them started on something before we can take a look. And that's really for comfort um, and of course, monitoring closely if they do start to show signs or we're seeing change in chest x-ray or increased white blood counts will pull back. But I feel like the alternative of keeping a strict NPO has at times more risks than, than benefits. I'm interested to see what, what everyone thinks about that though. Why not water? Well, I think um, one of the things that we can't ignore here um, and it's kind of two sides of very much the same coin. Not so long ago, we were amidst a, a, a pandemic where no instrumentals were available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, This is no different than most or many, many is probably the right word, um, skilled nursing facilities, extended care facilities, home health, et cetera, et cetera where there are no instrumentals also, and you'll wait weeks to get into a hospital or a clinic to have an instrumental done. In either case, you're stuck with the situation of, I don't necessarily want to commit this person to non-oral feeding. I don't necessarily want to alter a diet. What can I do? What can I glean yeah. from a clinical that is going to assist me. And if you trial the thin, for example, and you get a cough or a gurgly quality or some aspiration clinical sign, but you don't get it from the thickened, there's the argument that the thickened liquid might have taken care of the problem on one side. And on the other side, there's the question of where did the thickened liquid go? Um, so, I guess what it comes down to for me is seeing the person, their response, what are the other risk factors? Susan Langmore talked about them in her article. We don't need to repeat them. I'd say 99% of the people on this call know that article well. Um, but I, I think the question here really broadly is, what is the clinical benefit of either not or the clinical benefit of doing the thickened liquid, what are you going to gain by adding those thickened liquids? Um, is it worth the risk? Well, you make a really good point, Marty, because, and George, because remember where you're working. I mean, in an acute care, people change daily where, George, where you're going to, in a LTEC, it'd be different. And like you said, Marty, in a SNF or home health or an inpatient rehab, it's a little bit different. The beauty about working in acute care is you can have IV fluids, keep their mouths clean, do ice chips <clears throat> and put them on. Like I, there's plenty of patients I've put on a pureed diet with no liquids, ice chips allowed, meds and pureed foods, see them the next day and they're either worse or better. So it's just a really different area where you're working, where you make that clinical judgment. And like you said, Marty, there's, we didn't do instrumentals for a while during COVID and it taught us a lot. It taught us whether we're, you know, about our clinical, like Dr. I mean, Kendria, you have a fabulous course on the bedside swallowing of bowel and cranial nerves and really looking into the motor and sensory aspects of things. But you got to remember where you're working and what your, what your, your risk benefit ratio is. 
Yeah, I think that's great. I think, you know, I, I tend to gravitate toward answering this question based upon my opinion, which is influenced by the places that I've worked and a lot of other things. Um, but I think instead of providing like a direct answer, it, it's stepping back and getting a framework for thinking, like, what are you concerned about? What setting are you in? Because, you know, if you don't have enteral or parenteral hydration, there's a really high chance. In fact, there was a study that 25 out of 25 in an acute care setting didn't receive adequate hydration without enteral or parenteral hydration. And so you have that, are you shifting the problem from a pulmonary problem to uh, another area? So there's that consideration. So, I mean, that's going to be patient specific. Maybe that's not an issue for that patient, but if you're trying thick and liquids, um, I mean, on one hand, maybe they won't aspirate, but on another hand, it's heavier. And if they do aspirate and maybe we're more likely to silently aspirate it, are the, are the cilia and the trachea going to be able to, to lift it up because it's heavier? Is the cough going to be able to clear it? There are just so many variables, I think, beyond just the aspiration that personally, I gravitate much toward just a, a heavy, tremendously heavy emphasis on oral hygiene and kind of defining what that looks like for the nurses and going toward if they can masticate an ice chip, some of those soft ice chips to keep uh, mitigate disuse atrophy and maybe in sips of thin liquid. Um, I'm not saying that's going to fit for, for everybody, but for me personally, if they are bad enough that I am afra afraid, going back to my feelings, but as a clinician, I am concerned to allow them to have chips and sips I'm going to try to do all I can to get an instrumental, but I, I, there is that weird kind of purgatory that, that Marty's talking about with the pandemic or you're in a nursing home and you can't get things. That's just, it's such a tough place to be in. And I think it's just going to be so different for everyone that you've got to consider all these variables, risk benefit, as Joe said, and, um, and think through it. And then actually allow the patient to make the choice, right? <laughs> Collaborate with the doctors. This is, this is what might happen. This is the evidence for it. Um, you know, maybe even if it was my mom, this is what I'd recommend, but you make your decision if they're, if they're capable to do that and kind of shifting the responsibility to us being the facilitator with our, our skilled knowledge of, of, of what's the possible negative outcome and, and so on, but letting the patient exercise their autonomy. Yeah. And I, I think it's, it's important to say, and I said, I came full circle on this because I was in the camp of never, ever, ever. And I think it's important yeah. to 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 realize that there there is always a situation where something can be used. And I work in a, a small community hospital as well as the LTAC I was talking about, and that was the situation that I was thinking of. If it was the LTAC, I can get a fees and do it right away. But for those of you who are working in acute care, you you know this may resonate with you. You can't, while you have maybe a radiology suite attached to the hospital and you can send them down, it's not always that easy in terms of scheduling. Sometimes it can take a day, sometimes even two days to get that patient down. And um, if they are, like I said, violently coughing on, on water, even just a sip of water, um, that's a hard thing to recommend as is complete NPO status. So I will say it's a rarity, but I think that in certain circumstances, it, it's it's a, a viable option. It's hard to say never. Yeah. Hey, there's a really good thought. Oh, sorry, Marty, go ahead. I was just going to say, there's a lot more gray. And again, it comes back to that original question of the inflexibility. Um, I had a clinical supervisor back when I was an undergrad. Um, so that many years ago it was the very first patient that I saw and I had my plans all set, all written in the boxes that we were taught to do them in. Okay. No. I, when things were on paper, I went in with this plan, brand new green as a banana on a tree, wet behind the ears, whatever <laughs> metaphor you care to use. Okay? I spit out my water. <laughs> <laughs> and it was one of those things where my plan failed because I was dealing with an eight-year-old kid who had developmental apraxia. Long story short, I was effectively taken out of the session and my supervisor looked me square in the eyes and said, we are nothing but flexible. You need to understand that. And as I said, that's almost 30, that's more than 30 years ago. 
that I learned that. There is, I, I, the, rare is the case where it's black and white. It's mostly gray. And we just need to remember that. Yeah. I think a really good follow up to that. Um, oh, where did it go? So anonymous attendee attended Dr. Garan's recorded cranial nerve course. Fabulous content, they say. In practice, how often are you all incorporating a cranial nerve exam in your swallow assessment right up? I work in a sniff and I don't see any SLPs documenting this. Uh-oh. Yeah, because they're probably not doing one, right? I mean, simple answer is probably they're not doing one. Of course, in my course, you know, that ridiculous picture of me pointing up and my students always say they're going to make sure it's as cranial nerve every every patient, every assessment and reassess as needed. Um, it's super, super important. It doesn't, I don't, even in patients, <clears throat> when I used to do outpatient, you see anybody that would come in the door, um, uh, you know, even if it, the order was specifically for aphasia or something else that was unrelated to swallowing, I would still do a cranial nerve exam. Um, so I think that's just a simple answer is they're probably not doing it. That's why they're not documenting it. Um, if you do one, definitely document it, obviously. And so if you create those templates on the forefront, whether you do a smart phrase in, in your EMRs or whatever, or you, if you take the course and you um, hopefully got the clinical templates that I already put together, um, and then you can easily document it that way. And I'll just throw that this out there really quickly is um, doing it through the lens of understanding why you're doing it, the, the utility of it. And so behind that, you've got to step back and say, do I understand the, the synergy of these different cranial nerves and the sensory motor process of deglutition? Or, or if it's, a, you know, we're talking about swallowing, I guess, specifically here. And so that's going to give you a lot of valuable information that you're not going to get from watching someone eat a banana or, or a cracker or something like that. And so I, um, yeah, I just, I think there's so much to it. And I think that really, like, I didn't come out of school knowing anything, but like, okay, yeah, you watch them smile and you raise your eyebrows, but what does that mean? Um, if we could get much more of a depth, I mean, maybe everyone should go and take that course. I haven't taken it yet. I probably should go take it though. Um <laughs> If we get the depth, that makes us more of pathologists, of diagnosticians to actually understand what's going on and not getting teased by nurses for being the profession that watches people eat. Well, and, I, and that's a good plug for that case that we have for next week is that case, my the cranial oh. was performed leads very well to the clinical decision pathway for the case that we'll be presenting next week. Yeah. So Janelle asks, what is the course? There, there are two. There's uh, Kendra's cranial nerve course. Where can they find that? Uh, so there's one on speechpathology.com okay. and there's one through Asha Learning Pass. Um, okay. uh, yeah. Awesome. So that's the cranial nerve course. Um, the the other one, there's a confounding case series course that Kendra is doing next week. And so that's the other one that she was talking about. And that's on, on the Swallow the Gap website. Cool. Any other thoughts on that one? If not, there's another good one to go to. High flow nasal cannula. Where did that question go? Oh, I have it. You want me? You got it? Yeah, yeah. You want? If you have it, you want to read it? Yeah. Um. So this is kind of stemming from. Um. Okay. So high flow nasal cannula always a hot topic. Um. Even especially for sig thirteen. Uh. So does it increase dysphagia? Does it increase aspiration risk? Um, so what's the guide to giving oral trials um, in somebody that is has high flow nasal cannula and any updated information within the past couple of years that you guys want to share with our audience? They just did that airway fundamental course, and there was a lot of information on high, high flow nasal cannula from respiratory therapists and speech pathologists. Um, and if you didn't see that, I don't know if they're going to record it and let people see it down the road or not, I would assume that the ASHA would do that. Um, I don't know. I, I just, we, we see people on high flow and it really just depends on the, the patient's ability. Mobility is huge. Ability to follow commands is another yeah. one. Um, they adapt really quickly. I know that there is a lot of people that will, what I do is have clinicians go on high flow so they feel it, but then you have to learn that you'll adapt to it. So it really just depends on the flow, the FIO2, if the patient is alert, oriented, can follow commands, can get in a chair, um, and you do the same thing. You do what Kendria said, you do a very thorough clinical 
bedside swallow valve with a cr cranial nerve valve, and you just look at respiratory rate. And are these is this patient trending worse and going to get intubated? Is this patient trending better? It's just like a case by case basis. I know George, you probably see high flow a lot as well, um, but we just do case by case basis, and I know that is kind of a cliche. But there are people that actually can eat on high flow. They can do fees. And George, you can um, explain more about that. And there are, you can take them to radiology. We've taken people in radiology at 60 liters at 60% FiO2. And they'll say, well, you can't do that. You know, we can't take patients down for that. And I think, wait a second, they, you, don't you take them down for an MRI and a CT? And they go, yeah. And I'm like, so we can't take them to radiology if we want to do, especially if we think there's an esophageal component. So I won't, George, you know, I mean, I just think it's a case by case basis, but don't be afraid of it, right? Yeah. And um, in the community hospital I work in, I have to I have to take that tip. I have to learn from you on that and, and push back because they they give us a lot of trouble with trying to recommend patients for modified barium swallow studies. And we don't have access to fees there. But but in the LTAC, certainly I I sort of treat it like a patient with a trach. Because the tracheostomy tube, yes, it can cause issues. It can cause changes in airflow and physiological changes. Um, so can a high flow nasal cannula. But it tends to affect those patients that are already at high risk. So, you know, a healthy person on a high flow nasal cannula with a normal swallow is probably not going to be aspirating huge amounts and have aspiration pneumonia from it. But then again, a healthy person would never be put on a high flow nasal cannula. So you have to look at, again, the full picture, see what, what the, the basis for them going on high flow is, see if we can drop down the pressure a bit. Um, is there a little bit of wiggle room so that they're not uh, above that sort of magic number of 40 liters per minute, 45 liters per minute, where the risk of kind of pushing that sort of CPAP, BiPAP level where food and liquid gets pushed into the airway. So all of these things are concerns, but they're certainly not going to take anyone out of candidacy, especially if we do a fees and see that they're protecting their airway and doing quite well and the risk factors are low. I mean, we push forward with, with patients that have high flow quite frequently and they, and they do very well in my experience. That's been my experience as well. Um, I, you know, I, again, coming back to the literature, I haven't seen, I don't think any studies on patients. They've only been on normals that I've seen. Um, there was one study very specifically, Katie Allen and Christine Gaelic uh, did a study on a number of folks. And they found, in fact, that the airway was closed longer with high flow nasal cannula which bodes well for anybody who's looking to protect their airway. Now, whether that happens in patients, it's, we have yet to find out, but at least it's a step in the positive direction there. Um, my approach is actually quite similar to Joe and George in that each patient unto themselves. Uh, my personal approach is I don't want to feed anybody um, straight from a bedside or a clinical swallowing evaluation without an instrumental evaluation to definitively tell me, or at least as definitively as we can get in the moment, um, whether the person is safe on a high flow nasal cannula. Um, the other thing again, and I'll, I'll raise this issue, we do this all the time in critical care patients. What is the risk? What is the need? What is the benefit? Do we need this in the moment? Can the, is the, if the person is getting better, great, go for it. But if this person is circling a drain, looking to get the decision between reintubated or not, this is not the person that really is prior, prioritizing swallowing the moment. Breathing is the bigger issue. Let's stabilize that. Let's get that to a place where we can evaluate the person and just have the conversation with the medical team saying, I understand you want oral meds. I understand you want this person to eat. I think breathing is a little bit more important until you can tell me that this patient is a little bit further away from getting back on the vent. Um, there have Don't be afraid to push back in those regards either. Breathing and life will always trump swallowing. And we can't forget that. 
And if you, if you, there's, um, if you talk to a respiratory therapist and thanks George for the compliment, but, and I don't know why, where it just popped in my head, but you know, you see, you see people bagging people all the time going, going to the MRI and, and taking high flow down a hallway. And they're like, where are they going? CT. And I'm thinking, well, how come they won't go to radiology with me, you know, or how come I can't scope this person? What do you mean? I can't do this. And I don't know what it is about. We can't do that for speech pathology, but we can do it for other tests. And so that's when I, I started saying, um, didn't you just take this person for an MRI yesterday? Can't we just do this? And then just, you know, it juggles things with radiology. But like you said, Marty, if you talk to a respiratory therapist, a patient on high flow or a respiratory patient would rather breathe than eat. And they'd rather breathe, they'd rather drink than eat. So if you could just get people on ice chips, like you said, Tim, so that you don't have that disuse atrophy. A lot of my patients, they just want to get in a chair. They just want to have ice chips where I live. They want to have them flavored with Diet Coke. And they just want a few of that kind of stuff just to be satiated and keep their swallowing going. They don't want to have a full meal. They just want to be able to continue to swallow and not have nothing in their mouths for days on end. Um, and maybe that's all that you can do until they get more stabilized, like you said, Marty. But we're not afraid of high flow. I don't the, know. The biggest complaint that I hear from patients, I, whether they were on an endotracheal tube, high flow nasal cannula, they could be on a nasal cannula at two liters. The biggest complaint that I hear is that their mouth is dry and they want something. That's it. Plain and simple. Get something in my mouth to drink. I don't care if it's a drop, an ice chip or more, but give me something. Joe, can I ask you what your experience is with patients that you drop a little bit of soda into? Because I, I have tons of patients that ask for this and mm. there's sort of like a mental block between ice chips and ice chips with a little bit of something for me. Do you find that they do well if you're just splashing it with a little bit of something? Because I feel like that would make a world of difference to my it patients. Makes huge, it makes a huge difference. It's, I don't know what it is about Diet Coke in Southern Utah, but it, they call it the, the <laughs> gods of something. And I don't drink soda, so I don't know, but I do like wine. So if, if, if I was in a hospital, Kendry or Marty, splash <laughs> a little you know, Pinot Noir in there, and that would make the huge difference. And it's seriously... The big thing, like you said, Tim and, and Marty, and everybody said this, oral care. If you can get these people's brushing their own teeth, sitting up in a bed in a chair position or that brushing their teeth and saying, hey, I'll get you some ice chips. Do you want me to splash some Diet Coke in there? They'll do anything for the PT or the nurse if you do that or coffee or you know whatever they really, really like. And it's like, is that really going to give them aspiration pneumonia and kill them? Nope, but it does give them motivation, a ton of motivation. And I used to do flavor things like that to try and get that sensory system going to initiate swallows for people who were really, really bad decades ago. And then I thought, why am I not doing it for just satiation for people, for satisfaction, instead of just ice chips? Yeah. And I, mean, I don't pour it in there, you know, and I don't let them do this all the time, but they don't want to do that. They just want to breathe, but they want to have something to swallow. I had a really good friend who had angioedema and he was intubated and was extubated in this, the, the speech therapist, you can't have anything for 24 hours. And he was just, he got his wife to FaceTime me. <laughs> and I thought, I'll do the big gun. Give the guy some eyes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so Carmen says, love the practical and patient centered suggestions here. I, I was thinking the same thing. We forget about the patient behind the diagnosis. We're not fixing a car, right? It's not all the same. We've got to consider their values and ultimately they're in charge. Well, oh, and the nuances of each patient, but uh, time has flown by. Um, is any, are you all going to, if we're five, maybe 10 minutes over, like if you have to run, you have to run. That's totally fine. Um, I'll, I'll try to wrap it up maybe like five after, but there are so many good questions and I hate to miss them all. Um, there is one that has been upvoted a whole lot, but I've also seen several on EMST, but because this one's been upvoted like 11 times, I'm going to read it. So someone says thoughts on making recommendations regarding oral medication after a bedside or a clinical eval, uh, i.e. NPO except for meds and puree pending MBS or fees. Sorry, I didn't read that very well. Thoughts on making recommendations regarding oral meds after a clinical eval, such as uh, NPO except for meds and puree, ex uh, pending their instrumentation. Although we all came off our mics, we're all like, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> like this excites us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, go ahead. 
I I've been guilty, but I mean, oh, I do it. I do it every week. Heart There's just mm. times when they've got to get oral meds in. It doesn't, you know, I can't, I can't crush this. I can't, I've got to float this in something. It's got to be through the GI system. I can't give it. And you just try, you just, you know, give them some oral meds and I do sips and chips and come back the next day. And um, I don't, that's, I've never seen anybody have a deleterious effect of that overnight, but I'm in acute care. I, I'll tell you where I, I see more difficulties. Um, and it's not the oropharynx, believe it or not. When patients come off the vent, I, I kind of have this little pet curiosity, um, probably at some point enough to be able to want to study it. If I had some willing participants and colleagues, but there might be something going on later in the esophagus. I see a lot of pills hanging around in the esophagus and not qu quite so easily let go through the LES before it gets into the stomach. Well, it's not so much, you know, What's try, that? try and follow it with ice chips. Cause I've seen enough yeah. stuff sitting in esophagus for two minutes and you're like, Ugh. you know what I yeah. mean? I, I can tell you, I have irritated yeah. many a radiologist with the 13 millimeter uh, barium pill um, because the radiologist says, okay, let's try it. Of course, the pill gets stuck and then it doesn't dissolve in the esophagus. It doesn't go down through the LES. It kind of just sits there and I say, okay, we turn off the scope and a couple of minutes later, we turn it back on. It's still there. And unfortunately, the radiologists believe that they won't let the patient go um, from the radiology suite or the radiology area before that pill is definitively in the stomach. So then the patient is pulled out of the room, taken to a different room, a waiting area, wherever it might be. The next patient comes in, you go to evaluate that patient, you swap out that patient for the first patient. And finally, if you're lucky, the pill has dissolved. If not, we're right back to the waiting room for patient number two. Um, that's where I'm seeing more difficulties definitively than without with seeing anything in the oropharynx being an issue. I don't think I've ever had a problem with the oropharynx and oral meds, especially in the vehicle of puree in some form or applesauce or whatever it may be. Yeah. So there are a lot of questions that we will not address. Um, just running out of time, but what I would ask you, if you wouldn't mind, if we didn't address your question, please send it to tim at swallowthegap.com. What I'm trying to do is find a lot of different modalities to, to address these things and to get people talking. It, it, it takes a, a lot of work to have like a forum, but even the idea of people who are on podcasts and others have follow, who have follow-up questions, they can submit their questions and maybe the person who recorded the podcast can do like a follow-up five minute, just like a nano short podcast to address those questions because it's a conversation. It's not meant to be one-sided um, because those who are, are, I mean, we're all learning, but those who are listening are trying to integrate with their case and that's going to sometimes take some back and forth. So I would absolutely love that if you, if you send your questions so we can try to figure out a, a different way to address them. Uh, really appreciate. I cannot express how much I appreciate everybody being here. Um, and not just that, I mean, the panelists, everybody who's helping, but everyone who's attending, I, um, I sound like a cornball, but seriously, like getting a little emotional thinking about it. Like, this is fantastic. There are uh, a couple of things that are coming up. So Kendrea next Thursday at seven is going through, we're doing this confounding case series where we're looking at real interesting cases that are kind of outside of the norm. Um, she's going to walk through that. There'll be Q&A involved in it. It's um, similar to this. It's like six to eight bucks. It depends. And then uh, Joe is going to do something that Kendrea recommended. Uh, she, you, you heard it at ASHA a while ago and thought this was a particularly good case, but um, I'm really looking forward to that one. A lot of these include instrumentation and, and different things that really help getting you thinking. So thank you for that. Thank you for attending. I'm going to go back and quit sharing my screen. There is a short survey at the end of this. The only, uh, pretty much all the questions are optional, but the information really helps out a lot. Um, any parting words, y'all? I love this. I wish graduate school was this. It, this was two years of just open discussions. I yeah. think, I, you know. Not to it, talk. 
Right. Like just to, um, to learn from each other. And so I hope within your facilities, you're doing something similar with whether it's a, you know, a back lunch, an opportunity to do a journal club, but like, you know, I know there was a question about, so what do you, how do you learn like, and all this stuff, but, and, and, you know, a lot of us present and go to conferences, but it's not just for us to present, but to also have these discussions at the bar afterwards and at dinners and getting to build upon that network of expertise where, yeah. cause we also share patients. I mean, I'm, I still send videos to people and say, Hey, what do you think of this? I, and we all do that with each other. Um, and you know, Tim, you sent me one, you know, last week, Wait, what do you think of it? So I it, sent you so a picture of my lateral, my lateral view today on a, on a dentist x-ray. I was like, my throat is really narrow from my posterior tongue to the posterior pharyngeal wall. Anyway. So yes, yeah, so I think it's just it's, so it's it's a great opportunity, and um, we learn just as well too because you also can challenge us based on your own um, challenges and obstacles that you're facing. Uh, uh, also helps me learn as well. So thank you all for attending, and yeah. thank you so much for hosting us. Oh, I love it. I'm feeling good. Um, Wendy Chase. I don't know who you who of you all know Wendy Chase. If you don't, you should. She's a remarkable individual. Um, but she has a lot of experience in, in LTAC. But one of the things, she's a clinic director, and I think will soon be the program director at, at Rocky Mountain University of Health Professions. And just the, we've talked about the idea of the modeling these conversations in front of students to debate because the critical thinking is missing. I mean, it's not totally absent, but proportionally, we have so much knowledge, but the idea of critical thinking and how to challenge assumptions and and in, integrate is is so um, far below what it should be. And that's what I, I really think we get out of this. I love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah, what's what's specifically helpful for me even tonight, talking with such amazing clinicians such as yourselves, is that you know you guys have such a command over the research and then having so many years of experience helps you put that into perspective in a way that allows you to answer these tough questions. For example, can we recommend NPO except for meds? That on paper seems like a very hard thing to do. It's, it seems like it might be dangerous. You know, Why is the patient NPO? Because they can't swallow, so why are we giving them meds? But then we have Joe's experience and Marty's experience telling us that well, I've been doing this for years because they have to take meds and I'm doing it in a way that's safe and it clears out and I've never had a problem. And that's just not something that we're going to see in the research. That would just be a really difficult thing to study, right? Mm -hmm. And so we would never find that out without clinicians such as yourselves being honest and forthright and talking about these really tough questions. So thank you for that. Sorry, I don't want to draw us out too long, but there's one thing that goes really well with that. Um, Alicia Vos was here. She left. I wish she was still here because she could maybe put this into better words than I can. Um, in a podcast we were doing, she emphasized and really got me thinking more and focused on the nuance, the nuance. Not everything is black and white. And I think by having all of these different perspectives, I mean, add up the years of experience, you get the nuance from that. I mean, you get so much more nuance from that and for all the uh, attendees who are putting their thoughts and their questions out there. Well, and just to, sorry, quickly add on one more thing. <laughs> My students, well, yeah, every time I say that, they roll their eyes, but like, but I extending that also to us as well. So we, you know, a lot of what we said were very similar. We're shaking our heads. Yeah, no, we don't disagree. But there are times where even we may disagree Absolutely. in our practices, right? Mm -hmm. And so, because it's then we're still autonomous clinicians. Like Marty was saying, it's not black and white. It's We have a lot of gray in our areas. It's guided by our own clinical expertise, obviously, because that's one you know of our pillars of EBP practice. And so I would, so I just want to echo that, that it's, it's, it's okay. And that's why, again, if you have these discussions and you're still promoting critical thinking, um, you can still potentially disagree with another person. And so I don't want anybody walking away and be like, well, I don't do that in my practice. And I don't, you know, you don't, you have to do what's best for your patient. Right. And so, I mean, yeah. And that's why, you know, we'll, you know, even at the bar, you know, after that conference, like, yeah, we'll get into some discussions where we're like, oh, I don't, you know, necessarily agree with that, or we don't do that in my facility. And that's okay too. One of my favorite things is listening to Joe's stories. 
about like such and such reamed me for this. And then they apologize five years later. You got to disagree. You've got to have the devil's advocate to challenge your thought process. Or are you going to be stagnant, do the same thing forever? That's what he's talking just about. <laughs> just, for point of, just for point of clarification, Marty, I, I have a more than one mouthful of something because I have seen like you have thinking this thoracic stasis. It's like, is this stuff ever going to get out of the out of thoracic stasis? And then there's times when I said, you know, if we can get things, can we can we shift all of the PO meds to IV? Because sometimes you can't get anything down. Like you've got someone with a lateral medullary stroke. It's like we need all, you know, tube feedings or switch everything. Can we get things that are IV? So you, you, like you said, you got to be really flexible. I, but I think <clears throat> I think I've I've long held the belief, and I, I suspect most of us on this webinar have a similar belief in that the exam truly begins when you find something wrong. Um, we're not there to find what's normal. We're there to find what's abnormal uh, or not typical and, and do something about it. In much the same context, um, disagreement is the crossroads between learning and validation. Um, I don't wanna be validated. I know what's in the literature. I, I know what I know clinically. I want to know something that I didn't think about in a different way. I want to know something that uh, somebody came up with a different or better way of doing it. And that might be the next way that I do it. And these are the kinds of discussions that I, and I'll just echo what everybody else has said. I, we never had this when I was in grad school. You guys are so doggone lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, and, and frankly, I'm lucky too, to be a part of this. So thank you, Tim, for having this. And thanks everybody for being on the call. This has been a pleasure. I, I, same, an absolute pleasure. It's been a lot of fun, Tim. Thanks. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. Yeah. Thanks uh, everyone. We'll have to do this again soon. Keep your eyes on, I mean, if you're not on the email list, I send out this information or on Instagram. And then there's Kendra's case next week, which I'm extremely excited for. And there will be some dialogue in that. So thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day and hope to see you soon.